Uh, thanks for joining us today for this edition of The World Today, a program of Perry Rold House at the University of Pennsylvania, as many of you know. Uh, I'm LaShawn Jefferson. I'm the Senior Executive Director here. Uh, today's program is co-sponsored by the Center for Africana Studies, the Marginalized Populations Project, and the Center for Latin American and Latinx Studies. As usual, we are extraordinarily grateful for their collaboration and programming today. And as usual, you get to hear me talk about a few housekeeping things, and I've pardoned it, pardon me if I'm boring either you all here or those of you online, but um, these programs are only useful and only interesting and only exciting because of the questions that you ask. We like a participatory audience. So to my right, for those of you who are here at the University of Pennsylvania, is will be a standing mic, and you should be prepared to be brave and to go up there and ask any questions that you think are relevant. For those of you who are online, you should obviously drop your questions in uh, the Q&A function within Zoom. Um, within uh, Zoom, there's also a chat function, and we use that for any technical problems. And so if you're having technical problems online, please um, place your uh, uh, questions or problems there. And we'll also drop resources in the chat function as the program goes along. Um, we also have closed captioning for those of you who need it online. You know how by now to activate and deactivate that uh, closed captioning button within Zoom. Um, it goes without saying, and yet I will say it anyway, that um, part of the excitement of these weekly programs in this conversation series is that we get to be among people and learn from one another. We learn not only from the people who are on stage, but we learn actually from the audience and from the questions that you all ask and from the way that we engage one another. But we do like for that engagement to be civil, for questions to be clear, and for questions to end in a question mark and to be as succinct as possible. And with that, um, this week's The World Today will address the political insurrection that occurred in Brazil on January the 8th, 2023. Supporters of former President Jair Bolsonaro attacked a number of federal buildings in Brasilia in response to his defeat. The attacks have been compared to the attempted insurrection here in the United States in response to Donald Trump's electoral defeat in 2020. And it's up to you all to decide whether or not with our expert panel, whether those comparisons are overblown or just right, or to kind of critically assess that statement. I'd like to um, introduce and welcome our speakers and moderator for today's uh, program. And I'm gonna do so kind of very uh, quickly with brief introductions. Mariana Felix de Cuadros is a PhD student in the political science department at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. Her dissertation project examines the omission of race and the discipline of political science in Brazil. Uh, John D. French is a professor of history and African and African American studies at Duke University. He's the author of the prize-winning Lula and his politics of cunning from trade unionism to the Brazilian presidency. And look what I have here, a copy of it for your reading pleasure, maybe. Uh, last but not least, our moderator, Michael Hanchert, is the Gustav C. Cumarelli Professor in the Africana Studies Department at the University of Pennsylvania, where he directs the Marginalized Populations Project. His research and teaching interests combine a specialization in comparative politics with an interest in contemporary political theory encompassing themes of nationalism, racism, xenophobia, and citizenship. It gives me very, very great pleasure to welcome all of them to the stage. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. First, I'd like to uh, like the panelists like to thank LaShawn Jefferson for her kindness and helping arrange this and providing the space and form for this conversation. Uh, to my Shatuk, Gabriel Hispanic and Michaela McNamara for the logistical and administrative support in making this event a reality. Um, thanks also to the Center for Africana Studies and the Center for Latino and Latinx Studies uh, uh, run by Dr. Julia Coletti. Um, I won't reiterate the uh, introduction 
our format is a hybrid. Our format is a hybrid format uh, between fielding questions from a virtual audience as well as the in-person audience. We'll start out with about 20 to 25 minutes of qu uh, questions and interaction between Professor French and myself, as well as with uh, Mayana Felix, who will be delivering a statement uh, in Portuguese that will be translated by Jessica Agnelli, who kindly agreed to provide the translation for us. Um, to get uh, started, Don and I have, we've known each other for some time. Uh, and the first thing that came to mind uh, for this discussion and thinking about Brazil and its implications for thinking about right-wing uh, authoritarian populism is a quote from Karl Marx's 18th Brumaire, uh, where he writes, all great historical facts and personages appear twice. The first time as tragedy, the second time as farce. This is from the 18th uh, Brumaire. And uh, I was thinking about this uh, today to set up the opening question for our conversation to Professor French is as a scholar with a deep appreciation and in insight into Brazilian politics and history, including the Brazilian government's longstanding relationship with the US government, how to explain what appears to be the extreme political polarization in Brazilian society after the most recent elections. Yeah, um, well, thank you, uh, Perry Worldhouse and the people that made this possible and to everybody that's in the audience here and online. Um, you know, I would say that the um, there's a lot of talk both in the United States and in Brazil about polarization. And to be honest, I'm not completely, I don't completely buy the notion that polarization in and of itself is a bad thing. There's a kind of an ideal that if everybody was muted and sufficiently uh, unenthusiastic about politics, that that would be a good thing. But actually, I'm not, I don't actually buy that premise because the fact is there's many problems that need to be solved. In terms of the question about the, um, you know, the polarization, the election that just happened in Brazil is, um, you know, was a, it has a number of features. Uh, Lula has returned to power after having served twice and having won, uh, come in either first or second with his candidates in eight elections in a row. I mean, he's really, it's an electoral phenomena, what's happened in Brazil. And what I would say is that the polarization actually was much, much worse in, in 2015 and 2016 when the center-right parties, with the support of elements of the U.S. government, impeached a democratically elected president illegitimately. If you're looking at the level of mobilization and polarization, 2016 saw two and a half million people demanding the impeachment of the president, even though there wasn't a legitimate basis. And it's that period of polarization that stretches from 2013 to 2016 that resulted in the replacement of a democratically elected uh, president with a uh, an illegitimate vice president who then announced a policy that completely opposed. Yet that was not considered, that was the actual polarization. Now. Bolsonaro comes out of that polarization. But on the other hand, if you're asking about this past election, I would not say this past election was as polarized as Brazil was at the height of the impeachment drive, which ended 13 years in which the center left, a center left and left led government, you know, undertook major changes in Brazilian society. So polarization, you know, we can talk about it one way or another, but you know, it's important. People want to talk about Bolsonaro as bad but they don't wanna talk about the issue of whether the illegitimate, uh, illegitimate uh, impeachment in the second year of a newly reelected president, uh, Dilma Rousseff. Okay, all right. So the limits to the comparison. Um, you said limits to the comparison, sorry. Um, how do you explain then Bolsonaro's rise to popularity and political power? Well, as we talked uh, off stage, he had no political party apparatus to speak of, no social, social movement support of him. And he was viewed by many as an intemperate re rebel, prone mm -hmm. to speaking out of turn and acting impulsively. Now that he seems to be on an extended stay in Florida, what do you think is next for Bolsonaro and his followers? Yeah, I mean, I, what I would say is the 2018 election is, a, is you have to understand it's a it's much different type of election than the election of Trump, which everybody considered to be a surprise. But on the other hand, in terms of expecting Hillary Clinton to win, because you have to realize that he ran with a party that had only a handful of representatives. It's a multi-party system. He ran with a na total national budget for his campaign that was less than the average, the budget of the average federal deputies campaign. 
He went, he did it with no support from any of the other parties and all of the political machines in the states. Right. Uh, and the fact is, and he was a figure who had spent you know seven successive terms in in office as a really, as he said, the lowest of the low clergy, completely nothing, you know, a person given to extra, you know, to extraordinarily prejudiced and, you know, get attention for being being folkloric, as they say, but very folkloric in terms of being extreme, you know, cast, you know, tortured, you know, in favor of torture, spitting on the, the, the statue of a federal deputy that was killed by the military regime, uh, calling for the assassination, the execution of the president, Fernando Enrique Cardozo, and so on. And that's what he was famous for. And he, although everybody kept saying he should be prosecuted or he should be punished, the Chamber of Deputies never did it. And he wasn't a big shot. He was only, his votes ran between 80,000 and 100,000, mostly among in Rezenji, in the area of, of military, um, you know, military families and things like that. So, you know, it really was, and I will say, I'll, I'll quote, you know, I'll quote, um, you know, uh, you know, Flavio uh, Bolsonaro in 2022, and he said, and yeah, he's absolutely right, it was an improbable victory you know, with, uh, against people who had always made fun of him and never accepted the idea it was anybody, somebody who threw, you know, threw back his shoulders and rejected all the rest of the political class, all of the media, all of their opinions and everything else, you know, and that was precisely, it was an, you know, it was a, a turn of the mass of the electorate across regions, especially in, except for the Northeast, the poor, you know, the poorest region, across, re across, the, uh, across Brazil, across the social classes, across black and white, that gave him a surprising, you know, we had 19% in the polls going in uh, and, and got, you know, came in, you know, you know close to 40% in the first round and then one with 56% in the second round. So it was a completely, now this is not a, the only thing I'll say bef and before we return to it is that these sort of elections, like what happened in 2018, an, an election of rupture is not new in Brazil. In 1989, there was an election of rupture in which Lula made it the second, um, made the second uh, term, mm -hmm. lost by 9%, but, and all the parties that controlled all of the governments and all levels of government couldn't get a single person with more than 5%. There's a volatility out there. And 1960 was the same thing, an election that was a surprise election in terms of somebody who came out from nowhere without much party support. So there's a volatility, and that's really quite different than Trump with Trump represent, you know, the Republican Party as a political machine that's deeply entrenched mm -hmm. and so on. So I guess part of what you're saying is that there are certain limitations in the drawing these parallels between Bolsonaro uh, and Trump. Um, at the same time, the cult of the outsider, which mm -hmm. was part of the discourse of the insurgent right in the United States, it seems like that has at least some parallel in the case of uh, the insurgents of Bolsonaro. And probably to make the distinction, the insurgents of Bolsonaro versus the insurgents of Bolsonarismo, to the extent there is such a thing. Yeah, I mean, you have to consider, I mean, if you're going to compare the rhetoric of the two men, there's obviously certain common themes, and he certainly has has courted the idea Bolsonaro has of being the, the Trump of the tropics and all of this. Right. But on the other hand, I would say, you know, all I would say is that if you're actually looking at the level of rhetoric, the level of rhetoric for sheer, you know, obstinate, impertinent, outrageous rhetoric, his rhetoric is radically more extreme than Trump. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a, it's a, there's a difference between calling for a policeman to bang the person's head when you're putting him into a police car, which Trump has done, versus calling for, you know, the, uh, you know, for um, breaking the bones and torturing people who are suspected of drug trafficking. And there's many examples like that. So I think the rhetorical things, the extremism, there's much more extremist rhetoric. On the other hand, he doesn't actually represent, and this is the whole point, he has, we can talk about what his support is, but you know, he doesn't come from a deeply entrenched social movement or a deeply entrenched things. That's what's being born now since the since his defeat in the election. And I think we'll turn to the insurrection at some point, uh, what people are calling an insurrection, which is actually giving it a greater a greater grandeur than what it was, which is a you know um, a, a you know a riotous vandalism against three of the main buildings after the inauguration of the president unexpectedly on a weekend when no one was in the building, right. in the buildings. Contrast, contrast. Um, well, actually, this next question is actually for you, but also for Mariana Felix. Um, the discussions or practices around racial and gender equality in daily life 
change that radically in Brazil under Bolsonaro. Mariana, Mariana I think this would be a good. Hi, everyone. Um, I would like to thank Professor Hanshirji, Leshawn Jefferson, and the staff of Perry Road House for the opportunity to discuss such a crucial topic and the panel with Professor John French. Um, após a presidência do Bolsonaro, é, muitos jornalistas, pesquisadores e jornalistas é, mencionavam a importância da gente separar né, o que era o Bolsonaro enquanto é, é, indivíduo do bolsonarismo como um fenômeno social. In the aftermath of Bolsonaro's presidency, many journalists, activists, and scholars have emphasized the need to distinguish Bolsonaro, the individual, from the social phenomenon of Bolsonarism. É, por muito tempo, a cultura política, os estudos de cultura política no Brasil já mencionavam que existiam valores autoritários e conservadores muito permanentes na população brasileira. É, claro que isso se deve, em parte, né, do processo de colonialismo, racismo, escravidão no Brasil, é, e, sem dúvida, esses valores influenciaram na eleição do Bolsonaro no Brasil. For a long time, the political culture in Brazil has had a very influential authoritarian and conservative values among us, the Brazilian population, part of the legacy of slavery, colonialism, and racism. Such values certainly influenced the Bolsonaro's election. É, como uma mulher negra, assim como diversas outras mulheres negras e pardas no Brasil, é, eu tive a experiência, né, a oportunidade de experimentar em primeira mão o que os apoiadores do Bolsonaro é, fizeram para a diversidade no Brasil, né? a forma com que eles manifestaram todo o seu ódio, violência, é, preconceitos e insultos de gênero e de raça. Né? Isso tudo levou, obviamente, ao maior medo da população brasileira. As a black woman, among very many other black women in Brazil, during Bolsonaro's presidency, I experienced firsthand the boldness of which Bolsonaro supporters expressed their discrimination, their violence, and racial and gender insults, leading to a greater sense of fear. Além disso, Bolsonaro também se opôs aos movimentos populares, né? É, de direitos sociais, de direitos humanos. É, como estudante universitária, eu adentrei a partir das ações afirmativas que nasce no governo Lula e que é uma, uma é, conquista do movimento negro no Brasil. E, infelizmente, eu vi a minha bolsa de, de pós-graduação é, reduzida. É, inclusive, as universidades públicas sofriam muito é, com a falta de recurso e quase fecharam suas portas. In addition, Bolsonaro and his supporters opposed social movements for racial, gender and human rights. As a university student who benefited from affirmative action, I saw my graduate scholarship reduced and my university nearly, nearly closed its doors due to a lack of public funding. In 2019, for example, as universities não tinham nem recurso para pagar seus professores, seus funcionários, né, quase fecharam as suas portas e a sensação era muito grande de insegurança física, econômica, social. É, nesse contexto, inclusive, é, muitas pesquisadoras, intelectuais, mulheres tiveram que sair do seu país por medo né, dessa violência física. E a gente podia mencionar aqui, com certeza o professor conhece, a Marcia Tiburi, né, Rosana Pinheiro Machado, que são é, mulheres intelectuais bastante conhecidas no Brasil e que tiveram que sair por medo né, de alguma violência física. In 2019, public universities were short of resources by the Bolsonaro administration. Many universities cannot afford to pay its teachers and staff was the struggle even to maintain electricity in their classrooms. The feeling of social and economic insecurity was significant. And because of the lack of security, many intellectual women, as she mentioned, saw refugee in other countries. For example, working and researching in universities abroad. Portanto, é importante a gente mencionar também é, a relevância dos movimentos sociais, é, das grandes segmentos no Brasil, né, dessa colisão de alianças em promover manifestações contra o governo Bolsonaro e que, portanto, enfraquecê-lo. 
É, esses movimentos, eles demonstraram é, a importância da diversidade em uma sociedade democrática. E, ao mesmo tempo, que um representante político ele não pode chegar ao poder sem respeitar a diversidade do povo brasileiro. However, it is important to highlight the resistance of coalitions and alliances among multiple segments of the Brazilian population in promoting demonstra demonstrations against the, Mo the Bolsonaro government. They showed the significance of diversity in a democratic society and that a political representative cannot be in power in Brazil without respecting the country's diverse population. Assim, a derrota do Bolsonaro, então, é o resultado desses movimentos políticos. É, hoje, no Brasil, o sentimento é de esperança com a chegada do governo Lula. Hence, the end of Bolsonaro's government is a result of the political movements. Today, in Brazil, the, mo the moment of, is of hope with the beginning of Lula's government. Thanks so much, and long live the words black movement. Thank you, Mariana. Um... We'll turn and pick up a, a, a comment that Professor French uh, made earlier on. Um, how do you account then for Lula's electoral vis victory after his imprisonment on corruption charges and then the decline of the Workers' Party's popularity during Dilma Rousseff's term as leader of the party and president of the Republic? I think actually, I'm not sure how many people in the audience know that backstory, but it's a very interesting one. Um, yeah, I mean, what I would say is the, um, I mean, the, the, the 13 years of, of, I wouldn't say a leftist government, but of a center left government, because all Brazilian governments, you know, the political have to have the support. The left at its height never had more than a third of the Chamber of Deputies, never had more than a fifth of the Senate, usually less, never had the majority of governors. Lula has a degree of popular appeal that is way, way beyond that of the organized left in, in all social movements. That's one of the remarkable things about Lula as a figure. Um, you know, if people uh, at, in all of the elections in which he has run for office, the all of the votes of all of the leftists, counting it generously, including people that we really aren't that leftist, were never more than 30 percent of his uh, of his of his vote. So he has this enormous, he's actually built up over, since 19, he emerged as a figure in 1979, he's built up, firstly, everybody has lived with and knows Lula, whether you like him or you don't like him, but he's also created this he has special set of ties. And you can hate, I mean, some of the people who vote for him don't like the PT at all. The PT has a, you know, as a, is a, a leftist political party with a degree of cohesion and things that's quite unusual. It's the largest leftist political party and the most active one and successful one. So the, you know, and actually, you know, the, the question about his jailing, which is the main thing, you know, the US government and the FBI and sectors of the, it didn't seem to have any trouble with buying into the argument, which was a false one to anybody who knew Brazil, that Lula was in some way corrupt. And that's the basis upon which they prevented him from running in 2018 in a very sort of jury rigged, uh, you know, internationally praised corruption investigation, which was actually a politically vindictive attempt to bar him from running for office. If he had run for office in 2018, he was ahead in the polls by a significant amount and he would have been elected. And because the people, including many people that then voted for Bolsonaro, the outsider, would have said, well, Lula's time was a good time. I like Lula. I don't know about the PT. I don't like the PT. That's fine. But so, I mean, the question, I mean, and then the issue of the PT, Lula wouldn't be what he is were it not for having a coherent party mechanism and a, 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 a set of tools. He's very much an organizational man as he was in the union and the, you know, social movements and an organized coherent party provide him with tools that allow him to use combined with the degree of popu personal popularity that he has. But he's not, uh, you know, so when people talk about the decline of the PT, first of all, the PT has about the same percentage of deputies. It's hardly surprising in 2016 when the entire media and the national television networks were saying the PT is corrupt, Lula is corrupt, and so on, that the, his vote went, the vote went down on the PT. But it's actually the resilience and the, you know, the resurgence you know, of the, of the PT and the left in general and social movements is not all, is not necessarily all that surprising, you know, because again, it's married to a figure with this enormous degree of moral authority and 
concrete things that have been done for the vast majority of the population, because that is the basis on which politics, that's where the dissatisfaction comes from. The vote is available. Brazil is a profoundly unequal society, much more unequal than here. It is a profoundly unequal society, socioeconomically, racially, by gender, and, and with a vast population of extremely poor people. And they care about immediate results. And that's what Lula, for, as a trade unionist, and Lula as a building a party, middle-class people, they care about corruption. They care about lots of things that they think of as highly important issues. But he knows that what people really want is, you know, bread in the, you know, you know, they want some meat in their feijão and arroz, and they need concrete benefits. And that's really what the politics he's done. And, you know, it's a, you know, the politics that he's done and the improvements, including a significant decline in the Gini coefficient of inequality in Brazilian society during the 13 years of his two terms and then the two terms of his elected successor are really important. Now, the economic crisis cause problems and then the massive assault on the governments of the of the of, of, of Dilma obviously impacted the popular opinion. But again, that's why they had to jail him without even, you know, against the law in 2018, because if he had been on the get ballot, he probably would have won even then. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's just a very different story than the story that one is likely to get. And even the New Yorker article by Anderson recently doesn't want to own up to what actually happened between 2014 when Dilma was reelected in a very close election, but then was impeached, you know, illegally and unconstitutionally. You know, so I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind. Everybody wants to turn it all into, you know, something different. And what's been remarkable about the election that just happened, and I toured with my book, which came out in Portuguese, two weeks in the beginning of September before the first round. What's really quite remarkable is the fact that the coalition that elected Lula includes a lot of the people, including his vice presidential candidate, who supported his impeachment and jailing. Because sectors of the center right that had moved to the right and, and supported the all out assault on um, 13 years of center left government and the PT realized with, with Bolsonaro, especially after the first year or so, that Bolsonaro, they had elected somebody so irresponsible and so poorly prepared to run anything. You know, he had, had no interest in running a government and running a government in a country, a continental sized government. A continental sized country like Brazil is takes a lot of work and he's got absolutely no so they realized what they had done, you know what they had done and what they had helped to contribute to. I don't think their support generated millions of new votes, but it certainly changed the sectors in the middle and upper class and sectors of the upper class as well that realized that they had made a mistake and they'd ended up captured by somebody and I just want to emphasize this about Bolsonaro is that nobody wants to talk about the fact that Bolsonaro, and this is the difference between his individual story and Trump, is that Bolsonaro comes from an extremely, as an extreme example of social mobility. He comes from an extraordinarily poor background in a, the, the municipio that's the, you know, the, that, that's the poorest municipio in the state of Sao Paulo, the richest thing whose industry is banana production. His father was a practical dentist, which means he was an office boy in a dental thing and learned how to pull teeth and was paid by peasants for pulling teeth. You know what I mean? He actually comes from nothing. Uh, you know, he ended up fi finding his way into the military because the military uh, uh, leftist uh, La Marca in the Valle de Ribera, where they're from, was there, was trying to set up a base there and the military showed up and he hung out with the military guys. And at the end they say, why don't you go to, why don't you apply to a military school? So he went to military school. So, but his story is not about a, somebody and all of his personal culture and his manners and everything else, he has no manners. He's a, you know, he gesticulates, he can barely form a sentence. The sophistication of Lula's capacity to speak is completely different. But, you know, then that's actually part of the identification because it would be easy to think that poor people in Brazil did not vote or were not enthusiastic for Bolsonaro or that black people in Brazil in millions did not enthusiastically support Bolsonaro, even though Bolsonaro is a stone cold racist and, you know, homophobe and misogynist and everything else. But you know the fact is there's a degree of identification from the bottom of Brazilian society about the, you know, the sense that the society is closed against us and anything that messes up the political order up there means maybe we've got a chance. The area that I study, the Baixada Fluminense, in recent decade, recent last 15 years, has gone from voting for Lula twice and Dilma twice to voting two times in a row 
It's an area that's two thirds black in Pardo, four million people. And Rio is now the, you know, the, you know he won, uh, Bolsonaro won in the 2020 election, even in the second turn in Rio. So, you know, it's, and I'm not, I'm not saying it's just popular sentiment because there's also his alignment with militias and, and things and controlled voting and a lot of other things that are very, but that are part of the, the, te the texture of the life of the poor and the marginal, which doesn't get talked about. But I do think it's important to recognize that Bolsonaro has the capacity for people to identify with him precisely because he talks just like everybody's, this is the joke in Brazil, everyone says, everybody has the uncle at the churrasco, at the barbecue on the weekend, who always goes on and on and on with his, his horribly backward, educate, un, uneducated positions on things. I love the military regime, torture is good, we should kill the criminals, you know, you know, what's wrong with, you know, why are gay people all of a sudden, you know, why aren't we persecuting them? You know, whatever, you've always had those people in all social classes, and that actually is what was potentialized by the emergence of this figure in a context of a disillusionment with an attack on the left and a disillusionment with the center right that you know, was just as corrupt, if not, actually more corrupt than the, the, the people that were impeached. And then when that was revealed, it left their voters with no alternative and they went for Bolsonaro. Got a question uh, from our virtual audience here. I got a question from our virtual audience here uh, for John. Uh, can you expand on your views on the illegitimacy of Ms. Dil uh, Dilma Rousseff's impeachment, given the due legal process it went through? Isn't taxing a proper legal process, quote unquote, illegitimate, a fact on itself cause for polarization? Wouldn't the avoidance of the Workers' Party to recognize the major corruption scandals they helped promote to be an important driver for such insurrection in the country? A lot of assumptions packed into well. No, I mean I have no problem. I mean I I I would say you know I would not I wouldn't call it a coup d'état in, in in terms of a military coup d'état. It's a parliamentary coup d'état. The issue is the ambiguity, the law under which they uh, the law that they used that Eduardo Cunha, the head of the Chamber of Deputies, who only accepted to open an impeachment process of Dilma, because. He had lied and said he had no Swiss arm, Swiss accounts. And when it was revealed that he did, he uh, he lied. He he was going to. He was on the ethics panel, and he's a man of enormously corrupt figure, very power, powerful figure in the Chamber of Deputies. And he said, if the PT doesn't vote for me not to be found guilty in the Commission of Ethics, the, the Ethics Commission, I will I will open the impeachment of Dilma. So he selected the random one, 20, 30 of them before he had rejected because he was, you know, he was busy impeding the government. But so, you know, the conditions about it in the law that they used was a law that was from the about impeachment, a very unclear law that was from the early 50s when Getulio Vargas was not liked by say, important sectors of the thing. So it's a, you know, I mean, it's a, you know, the the and the the business about having told the banks to make the payments for things and then we'll reimburse you afterwards. Every single prior president had done it. Every single governor does it. Every single city council, every city city government does it. You know, they they paid a lot of fiscais, which was really the only concrete thing. And there was not a single thing about corruption in the impeachment petition that was accepted. So you know, we can we can talk about whether I I called it illegitimate. I wouldn't call it a, you know, a parliamentary coup or an illegitimate you know impeachment. You know that that's a matter of uh, you know that's a matter of uh, you know of um, you know of opinion. But again, like I said, it's a you know it's still a touchy issue. Lula didn't insist that anybody say they were sorry that they supported his jailing or that they supported impeaching Dilma because he's big enough politician and they all need him and he's willing to be a broad <laughs> a broad unifying figure. So you know I don't think that's that our disagreement about the impeachment wouldn't necessarily mean that we're not on the same side of, with the questions that are produced by the, the person who just asked them, which at least gave me a chance to clarify. Right, right. All right, well, gentlemen, I guess once Anna asks the question, we'll start mixing up, getting- Trying to get this to be, yeah. um, I wondered uh, how much of this is a question of personalities? Um, because I think back to when Bolsonaro was running against Hadaji, and everyone, and you know, everyone I spoke to thought Hadaji was terrible, and so it was sort of Bolsonaro won 
by default. And, you know, with Jilma, you know, even the most right-wing people I know thought, well, no, sorry, the most left-wing people I know thought that Jilma was just incompetent. And, and, that, and so how much of this, if there had been a good, you know, for example, again, going back, when Alkmeen was running for president, he was regarded as the most boring, bland candidate that could be. So if we had had a good center centrist candidate, would, you know, would any of this have happened? You know, and, uh, and I suppose my question is really, you know, how much of this is all about personality versus policy? Well, I mean, I guess I, I like the question. No, I like the, I like the question, uh, but you know, people don't want to study, people aren't interested that much anymore in studying electoral politics. And it's, and somehow or other, if you say it's about personality, somehow or other that is, means it's not about other things as well. You know, what I would say about, first of all, you know, Alkameen, who's the vice president of Lula, it was the governor for, you know, two terms in, in the state of Sao Paulo, the, the richest and most powerful state in the country. Um, he, had ran, he ran twice against Lula. The last time he only got 5% in 2018, and his previous time he was defeated. Um, but he, he got a really good vote. I mean, the issue of the fragmenting of the right, the center and right, and the emergence of a far right group, that was what opened, the path for that was opened up by the, by the impeachment and the radicalization of the, of the process of going after Dilma. Now, you know, there's lots of things you can say about Dilma. Nobody, including the people, ever thought that Dilma was corrupt. Uh, Dilma was a manager. She was not a, you know, she was not a, you know, not a bad president, but she wasn't a political animal. You know what I mean? And being a political animal like Lula is, is something that, you know, obviously it helps to have the capacity, somebody who just loves to live and breathe politics and people and relationships all the time. So there's an extraordinary personal capacity, but I don't believe that if it had just been, you know, you know, Sergio Fausto, who I met in June, July, who's the head of the Fernando Enrique Cardozo Foundation, he was interviewed in 2018 and they, the person, because it was a folia and it was saying, you know, uh, who could who could win against the, you know, because Lula, it was always Lula and Bolsonaro, because Bolsonaro had a support in the, and it's a two round election. And why, why can't somebody from the center right, why can't they win? And, the, you know, and, and he said, and the person said, well, you know, isn't it, couldn't somebody with charisma come, you know, beat them or something like that. And he said, look, nobody, but who's the politician that has charisma in Brazil? The only person who has charisma is Lula. And it's true. I mean, the, the, this spontaneous appeal and this capacity, I, I fantasized when I was in, in there for two weeks doing my book tour in five states with an, a number of audiences about if you had had a meeting between Lula and Bolsonaro, it, when it came out, Lula would have been all, oh, my friend and whatever, and he would have just been sputtering because he wouldn't know, he doesn't know how to do interactions, interpersonal interactions, other than bravatas and, and, and like shouting and, you know, and being, you know, he's got, he's very, so I don't know. I mean, personality, I think makes a difference, but Lula would have been liquidated. People expected him to be liquidated when he was jailed and things like that. And people expected that the reservoir, I mean, Hadaji, who is the minister of education and a very good minister of education and also a minister, another minister and then mayor of Sao Paulo, you know, he substituted for Lula in 2018 and did very badly in the first round because nobody knew him. In the second round, he got 46% of the national vote, which wasn't bad against, you know, against, against uh, Bolsonaro. And, you know, I mean, he's probably the most likely person to be the next pre PT president or PT presidential candidate, but certainly he wasn't known. Although that didn't make, um, you know, the idea that Adaji was bad, nobody, I didn't know anybody who did. He's a university professor. He should have been perfect for the middle and upper classes. Maybe a little harder for the lower classes to identify with him. But, you know, you know the, the, um, so I don't know. I mean, politics is always going to have the issue of personality in it. And what it really comes down to hard work. And, you know, without his party, Lula would not have survived. And without the, you know, the, the political capacity to build coalitions, to create what I call as from the trade union forward spaces of convergence across difference. This is the essence of what Lula has always done. That's the nature of his politics, which doesn't mean he's not prepared to be, get involved with fights, including a sequence of three very militant strikes and the jailing. 
it's not that he's whatever, but that he's always about trying to, you know, trying to create the, the broadest possible range of people that relate to him with the idea of, of creating, uh, you know, the possibility of something that might be able to make change. So I don't know, I, I agree with you that opinions about people, you know, the, you know, vary a lot, but I do think that it's too simple to think that, you know, if only whatever, that, that's what happened to the center-right parties, they had nobody. Just like they in 1989, all the parties had nobody to put up against two outsiders, Kolar, who was a nobody, and Lula. Yeah, let's try to get to squeeze in a few more questions. One um, for virtual, then I'll get to you. Uh, this one is for Mariana, um, I'll first say it in English. Uh, could you amplify your description of the role of social movements so, or popular movements now within the context of the Lula administration? Você pode ampliar sua descrição do papel dos movimentos negros, movimentos populares agora, no contexto do governo Lula? Então, acho que a primeira questão da importância dos movimentos populares no governo Lula é a questão de dar respaldo político para o governo. A gente assistiu um governo da Dilma, onde teve o um enfraquecimento... É, de um diálogo com os movimentos sociais, isso inclusive foi ressaltado é, muito. Eu vou parar para você uh, uh, traduzir. Um ela, pode... Tá bom. Pode ok. Você pode traduzir para ela? Fala tá. Inglês, então. Então, <risos> já falou, eu não consegui. Oh, ah, ok. Yeah, well. She said, she said that, that, um, you know, the, that the role of popular movements now is to give support to the Lula government because in the case of the Dilma administration, there was a breaking of the dialogue between social, mo social movements and the government which weakened it. Isso. É, muitos movimentos sociais no governo Dilma reclamavam dessa falta de diálogo permanente do governo. Ah. Tanto que agora o, o Lula também escolheu alguns nomes para cumprir o seu mandato, pessoas públicas né, e reconhecidas nesses movimentos para é, ter esse fortalecimento de diálogo. Yeah, during the Lula government, during the, the Dilma government, there was a there was a activation. Yeah, a a, 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 a a lessening of ties with social movements and things like that, you know, which which um, you know which uh, weakened it. And what's been done now with Lula's the new administration is the naming of a number of important figures from social movements to various positions in the government, uh, you know, from important social movements. Uh, two questions from the audience. Go ahead. Hi. Oh. I will just wait. Oh, okay. Hello. Uh, wait. Obrigado. First, and <laughs> that's the only Portuguese I know. And green, Midori. <clears throat> so uh, I think this is a question for all of our panelists. And this is a broader question. Um, because I'm a student of, oh, we have to introduce ourselves? No, oh. And, and you, yeah. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm So Yoon. I'm a master's student at the Graduate School of Education at the University of mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. Uh, yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. And, uh, okay. My question is about how does this current moment, um, what's this current moment? fall within this conversation of, you know, there's this concept of the West and the rest in terms of, you know, like developmental theory and I don't know, globalization, globalization, local, lo, uh, and localization. So I'd like to know your thoughts on um, how this moment falls within that framework. Thanks. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. One of the questions that Themes that John and I talked about offline. Actually, you had something to say about Lula's positioning in the, within the context of the global South. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the government of the, the, the Workers' Party and Lula's government was never a supportive, was always a sub strong supporter of a, as, as are the, you know, the Brazilian government at various points in the 20th century, I reject the international economic system and the international diplomatic system is very much controlled by the North Atlantic countries plus Japan and a handful of others. And they're very resistant to, uh, you know, they're very resistant to this world, which sets the terms for what positions you're supposed to take, even if you're from a developing country, uh, and uh, even if your economic interests are contrary. You know, Lula led the fight to try to prevent the, to bring about the end of the agricultural, the protectionist agricultural products of the Europe, you know, policies of the European Union, as well as of the US which for all of the claim to be in favor of free trade are designed, I mean, we pay a much higher price of sugar because we don't import sugar because of a handful of producers in Florida. So he, you know, the issue of South-South solidarity, and that's also the idea of the BRICS, the, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, and South Africa, which is also a, a, a diplomatic thing. And right now, the most important particular case, which, you know, the Europeans and the US are putting pressure on, uh, is the fact that the Brazilian government and Lula, even bef even on the eve of the war, are not supportive. I do not agree with the U.S. that the war in Ukraine is a good idea or that this is how we should redefine the entire political and diplomatic system of the world. That war is bad. A lot of unnecessary lives are going to be lost. That there were legitimate concerns on the part of Russia that should be taken care of. Uh, and, you know, should be recognized in some fashion, or as he calls for, you know, uh, you know, a, a uh, you know, a group to work for peace uh, and a, some, a peaceful resolution to the thing. And a peace does not mean the total victory for Ukraine. If you say the only acceptable solution is total victory for Ukraine, uh, you know, then you're not, you're basically saying the war is going to get deeper and deeper and deeper. When all of you know, when the German uh, prime minister was there 10 days ago, he publicly demanded in a press conference and, and raised the issue that they had asked Brazil to ship munitions to Ukraine that they have for, that they could send. And he said, no, we don't believe this is a war that's to the benefit of the people of the world. So, you know, they, the, you know it's an unjust international economic system. It's an unjust international balance of power. And to be honest, I hope everybody here will at least recognize that he, having the media talk about the West again is probably not a good idea. It means there's something wrong. Since that, you know, the West, which really refers to the, a few countries in the Far East, you know, in the most, you know, the most Western part of the Eurasian landmass, because Europe doesn't exist, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fiction. You know, uh, you know, so I, I don't know. I mean, the, but, you know, if you want to think about what, you know, where the, where the, you know, Lula and the government, you know, fit, I mean, they're going to be very careful. They're not, a, they're not critical. They're not, they're not going to, they don't support, and neither did Lula. He doesn't support the Russian invasion. It was a mistake. It was wrong. It was a violation of international law. It's just how do you deal with it? And that, of course, is the question that people don't want to ask because, you know, anybody in the rest of the world else who's not bought into this would, re would say, Hey, didn't the U.S. invade Iraq and Afghanistan? But of course, that has nothing to do with violating national sovereignty. I don't know. I think it does, but that's just my problem, right? But Let's group. Try to get a couple other questions in before. Yeah, please. Uh, my Thank phone. you so much. Um, I think it's striking just uh, the way you laid uh, striking the way you laid out the positions of this government, and yet how warmly they were received on the most recent visit. Um, and I'm wondering, just taking a step back, what does what you've seen, what you've discussed, what's happened in the past year or maybe decade say about the strength of democratic institutions in Brazil? And does that matter? Are we looking at it through the right frame? Yeah, I mean, I guess what I would say about that is, you know, the, the, the you know, Brazil has a, you know, has a, let's put it this way, you know, Brazil has a very different political and institutional systems, you know, coming out of a 21 year dictatorship and then the new constitution of 1988. It also has, on the other hand, a very powerful, uh, you know, institutional things, you know, the Ministerio Publico and the, ju and the judiciary system and, and the, you know, various groups of powerful groups within the government. The government is very important. It's more important in many ways than, than pri the private business sector is. 
in the Brazilian economy and things like that. And there's no question that the resistance to Bolsonaro by the institutions, especially the Supreme Court, which has been much more activist and much more compared to our conservative controlled one that connived with pretty much everything that was wanting to be uh, you know, done by Trump, you know, that they, that resistance made a big deal. And then in the summer, you know, midsummer, the final sort of shifting in the part of powerful actors and things like that had to do with the, uh, you know, the particular outrage about the threats that Bolsonaro openly made to go for a military coup and all of this sort of thing, which resulted in uh, economic interest groups and the business class and, you know, manifestos and, uh, you know, and so on by people who are not on the left at all who just said, no, this is not acceptable because to have reelected Bolsonaro would not be good for Brazilian capitalism. It would not be good for Brazilian society. It would have, or for those organized sectors of Brazilian society that are very powerful, you know, in the, that are part of the state apparatus. The only group with sympathy for the, you know, the sympathy for Bolsonaro is the military and that's a different problem, but they weren't about to get, launch on an adventure when he lost the election which is why they had to do this, you know, this, uh, this, you know, heroic insurrection, <laughs> which was kind of a joke, uh, not for what it pretended, but for what it was. I'm gonna try to get at least two more questions in before we go, Lynn, three more. Yeah, thank you. First, a protocol question. Shall I ask my question in English and then you translate it? Absolutely. Is that, Absolutely. Is that, that's how it's working? Yeah. So I have uh, two related questions. I think they're related. One is, uh, is regionalism in Brazil as important as um, it may have been in the past? Is it something that is increasing in importance or decreasing in importance in understanding the electoral patterns? And then somewhat related to that, and Mike, I hope you can translate. Do, should I pause? Perguntando se regionalismo é importante no para o Brasil e para o hemisfério. As eleições, para identificar os resultados das eleições. Mm -hmm. And uh, related, do you see polarization in Brazil as something that people in the United States should understand by comparison to our context, or should we understand it differently? Okay. Um, I will, uh, I'll answer the last part, and then I'll leave uh, the regionalism question if, if someone else wants to address it. I mean, we have to realize that the Brazilian political system is a multi-party system, and it is not based upon the idea of any sort of ideological consistency. All of the parties that aligned to give, that aligned, signed up with Bolsonaro, who claimed to have be totally against parties, but to survive and avoid impeachment, was prepared to turn over all of the resources of the federal government to the federal deputies and senators to win the votes of their vote and support. So he wasn't impeached for what he did during COVID. And the fact is all those parties, those parties that the, are the parties that are called physiological parties. They care about the practical things, who's got resources and who's got whatever. All of them, you know, so he, all of them, as soon as Lula was elected, they're always wanna be on the side of who's in power. So almost every single one of them went over to Lula immediately. You know what I mean? Including the, including the head of the Senate and the head of the Chamber of Deputies that the PT then supported their reappointment, even though they were the Bolsonaro people. The idea that there are ideologically consistent politicians, the great strength in Brazil that prevents it from having problems is you've got very practical people that just want to know, you know the famous joke about it from the 50s, you know, with, between Das Kapital by Marx and the Bible, which do you choose? And the Senator says, the federal registry, the Diario Oficial, because that's where contracts and appointments are. That's what I care about, which means it's actually a good thing because ideological polarization, which is what we actually have in the US that is coherent and structures the political system and structures the, the, the falsification you know, through gerrymandering of the results of elections, that is something that doesn't happen in Brazil. And that actually is a good thing. Two questions. Uh, regionalism. Okay. 
Posso responder? É, com certeza, a questão do regionalismo, inclusive para a integração latino-americana, né? O Lula é reconhecido mundialmente como é, um líder que busca sempre participar de reuniões internacionais, ele também sempre foi muito convidado para essas reuniões, né? É. Então, a eleição dele significa, sobretudo, também a retomada de alguns organismos internacionais que foi esquecido no governo Bolsonaro, até porque a gente não tinha um projeto de política externa, né? Esse projeto de política externa foi totalmente esquecida e agora com essa eleição a gente pode ir aí pensar. Eu vou fazer a transição. Uh, Lula é world renowned, he's known, he loves to hold meetings and events and he loves to broker alliances not only within the region but across the world. Exato. É, e aí, só para finalizar mesmo, é, para além disso também, é, da figura no sentido, política no sentido dele representar para além do Brasil. Né? Eu acho que o Lula também a, chegou num nível que ele é uma referência para além de uhum. dentro do Brasil, mas para o mundo também. Né? Lula é uma referência para o Brasil. E é muito conhecido além do Brasil. Obviamente. Oh. Hi, thank you so much for this wonderful talk and panel. Um, I think my question sort of piggybacks on two of the questions already, because I teach a class on international organizations in Latin America, mm -hmm. but I can just maybe you can expound a little bit. So I, I also had two questions. The first question, and maybe you answered and I just missed it, but to what extent was that insurrection, um, was there a transnational component to that where you might have seen right-wing groups from like the United States or other countries? I know you just said the nice difference between the ideology here being stronger in the U.S. versus more of this pragmatism, but still, I wonder to what extent might have there been transnational conservatives fueling that? And then secondly, um, uh, piggybacking on the question about the West and also about regionalism, what do you, I mean, could you expound a little more and talk what you think the role of Lula's administration in Brazil might be in terms of being, um, will it, because I know he's trying to maybe revitalize UNICER or, you know, might, what might be the role within the OAS or UN as well, or, you know, will, will Brazil, will he try to posture to become sort of like that regional hegemon? Thank, thank you. I'll take one more question and then. No, I'll, I'll wait. No, no, you go ahead that way we can. Okay, yeah. we, we have plenty of time. So yeah, yeah, we have until 5.15. So we've got 17 minutes. Um, and I'm worried about combining the questions because we've got excellent questions, but I'll add my on anyway. We can just keep a list. Um, and my question really is for, for Mariana and then potentially for John as a, as a second response. I was very curious that you pointed out um, that during Bolsonaro's presidency, there was obviously a rise and an increase of what I would call intersectional hate, right? So against women, against women of color, against... Oh, right. Sobre o crescimento de ódio e ódio interseccional dentro da população brasileira. Um, and so I wanted to get a sense from you of one, how you expect that things will change now and why. So that's the first part of it, how and why. Uh, and then the second part of it is really, um, and it's kind of a link to what John said earlier, which is that um, where do you think within those communities, despite um, Bolsonaro's uh, rabid um, misogyny, why was there support within kind of female communities of color in Brazil than for Bolsonaro, given that John has pointed out that, you know, people saw themselves in Bolsonaro. Um, so that's, that's kind of a two and a half part. Why did there was support for a candidate so misogynist between women and things in that community? That's a good question. Okay. Well, the racism, the misogyny and the machism are values that are very present é, em todo o contexto da população brasileira. O que é, nós podemos fazer para mudar essa realidade é a criação de políticas públicas. Né? E aí eu acho que um exemplo bem legal é as ações afirmativas. Você entende que tem o racismo institucional... Racismo e sexismo e machismo são muito centrais presentes na sociedade brasileira. E uma forma de contornar isso é através de políticas públicas e públicas. Sim. Você entende que existe um racismo institucional institucional que você precisa criar medidas para 
para alterar essa realidade. E eu acredito muito no papel que as políticas públicas têm e que agora, no governo Lula, nós vamos poder não só fortalecê-las, mas como também criar outras né, contra o racismo. Inclusive, a lei do racismo no Brasil foi alterada. Agora, a pena é muito maior. Então, acho que isso é uma questão importante também. Under Lula administration, there are more opportunities now to develop policies and programs directed at altering uh, and basically decentering uh, the racism and sexism in Brazilian society. Okay, okay. On the question, on the question about the, um, uh, on the question about the electoral results and regionalism, uh, Brazil is the, the elections since 2006 have shown one particular region, the Northeast, which is one of the two poorest regions is the stronghold of the vote. Now the, the Nordestinos, which is the most non-white part of the country, you know, and is, you know, there's, you know, it really, a lot of prejudice in Brazil is organized, even though it is racially hued, it is organized around Nordest, against Nordestinos who migrated, including Lula's family to the south, to the wider parts of Brazil. Rio and São Paulo and so on. So Nordes anti nordestino discourse and and you know is is a very powerful. It's it's tied up with racism, but it's also regional and it also applies to white people from these regions. And you know and and since 2006, in part because of the policies that so benefited uh, the populations in the poorest, especially poorest rural and small town areas like the family fellowship that paid a minimal sum if you kept your kid to the wife if she kept her kids in school and got them vaccinated, that vastly improved the economy in all of these desperately poor areas and things like that and laid a material foundation for the popularity that has been sustained. The only area that it was the richest areas and the most wealthy people who voted for Bolsonaro, the richest states and the richest regions, and it was the Northeast that voted against, against uh, Bolsonaro in 2018 and again came through once again now and the, but this election was not because of the North one because Lula recovered the vote in in Minas and many other places which had been lost before because of this antipathetic thing so regional polarization you know is part of the story you know the there's a lot of prejudice towards these especially the northeast yeah. you know and and on international organizations i wasn't sure exactly what was being uh, said but asked about but you know the oas has been a disgrace from the point of view of the people in the pt in terms of how it's handled uh, under almagro everything the oas has been doing has been a disgrace in relationship to the uh, coup in bolivia and everything else i mean is uh, in various international institutions have mixed have mixed records about whether they're do what they're doing is you know whether how it fits in uh, brazil is very committed which she said which as well to the mercosul which is the common market of the south which was not a project you know the project bolsonaro didn't support any of those sort of regional regional identities but i think the issue of international organizations you know the the, the longest landing longest standing dispute of the brazil as a foreign policy and it's always had a very a tried except under bolsonaro to have an independent stance in relationship to the central powers is the fact that brazil thinks it deserves a, a place on the security council which it does not have Plus, and I've heard this at international meetings, Brazil is also upset that Portuguese, which is the world's 10th largest nation language, is not a required translation uh, in the international institutions, which is a grievance of theirs. I've heard people make this officially as a, yeah, yeah. As a complaint. Yeah. Okay. Hi, thank you so much for this panel. Um, my question is in regards to sort of the role of religion in all of this, like Good. obviously, uh, in America, a big part of polarization is right, this right. like firm alignment with um, the right of you know Christian evangelicals with the whole moral majority movement and so on and so forth. And I'm not super familiar with Brazilian um, electoral politics, but how does the you know Christian movement sort of relate to that? And Bolsonaro sort of builds himself as you know a firm uh, Christian uh, espousing like Christian right values. And so does has he changed the alignment of uh, Christian? organizations to be more firmly within a certain party or behind a certain figure, or are they more independent than in the US? Yeah, uh, what I would say in that regard is, is uh, you asked an excellent question. It was on our list of questions that we came up with. And 
in both in 2018, I mean, Brazil, the social movements that, uh, that mass social movements against the military dictatorship that Lula came out of were very, very powerfully associated as is Lula with the Catholic church. It's an overwhelmingly Christian society. And at that point it was an overwhelmingly Catholic society. And the Catholic church was fundamental to all the social movements from black movements to labor unions and everything else, especially liberation theology, but even beyond that. And on the other hand, one of the things that's happened since then, beyond the Catholic Church under you know under uh, the Polish Pope cutting back and beginning to sort of appoint make appointments and curb the left of the Catholic Church, which was a majority in the 70s, the other thing that's happened is that Brazil now is a 40 percent a 40 percent Protestant society, and the growth of the evangelical and Pentecostal churches. Uh, you know, Crenchis, as they call it, are, is extremely important, and they are very, very, they politically, uh, they, in general, there's been two trends. On the one hand, they tend to want, they want very, pra the people who run the, ch the churches that are large, that own TV stations and all this, they want the concrete things out of government. They have a, a whole sector of politicians in the Chamber of Deputies and the Senate, they have an evangelical front and all of this sort of thing, but they usually have been prepared and they supported Lula and Dilma's government for the most part. But in the context of the crisis that began in 20, you know, 15 and 16, uh, when you get to 2018, especially with the wide circulation with WhatsApp and cell phones having become universal, they very much, and especially some of the most powerful uh, evangelical leaders and things like that, really were able to sway their population and their base of support is the popular classes and especially and especially women and especially in poor areas. The only new constructions you'll see in the Baixada are large churches of the Assemblea de Deus and all of this sort of thing. So it's estimated that about 70% of, uh, of Crenches uh, in 2018 voted for it and probably about the same percentage in, in the, about the same percentage. On the other hand, a study done in the Baixada that's going to come out in next year, a survey of 1,500 people according to their religious beliefs and also asking then about public policy, everything from abortion and gay marriage to affirmative action, social redistribution of wealth, you know, whatever, actually doesn't show that the preferences are so radically different among rank and file Crenches and rank and file Catholics. The only group that is actually, can, you know, they, I mean, they, you know, the only group that actually is most consistently in, fa in favor of what perhaps this audience would think of the bright policies are the 15% that say they're not religious and they support all of the things. But in general, it's not a radical, the, the, the making of the crenches, there's a lot of prejudice among intellectuals in Brazil towards the uh, crenches and believers, you know, and a lot of anti crenchy you know, uh, discourse, which is really not a, you know, but it's a, you know, it, I wouldn't say it's the same as here. And and they pretty much, except for a handful of them, fall in silent because basically they need to find their way back because there's things that Lula's government can do for them. You know what I mean? Which doesn't mean that they're not, you know, part of the the insurgent far right, you know, fascistic sort of mass movement that they're trying to build. And that's what the so-called insurrection was. It wasn't an insurrection. It's that they had done these encampments, which weren't very large, for months in front of the military headquarters demanding a coup. And, you know, how are you going to end it? And they had to end it with something. And if they didn't end it, I mean, this is essentially a cadre building sort of a thing where, you know, people don't think of the Bolsonarismo as not the same as Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro did not convoke people. He did not lead the resistance. He did not call for these encampments. He was silent for three days very different from Trump's role as the man who organized the entire thing to be done on the day when it would actually stop the process. But the people that are building this far right movement, they don't require, they, they have to figure out how to end it. And it's better to end it with a bang, even if it's a bang that, you know, where all the Bolsonaro politicians that were elected and governors all came to the Capitol and said, oh, we support democracy and all of this, because they, they need their movement to have some real to have achieved something in the same way that the martyrs of the you know January 6th here are going to we're not we're going to be living with them for the rest of our you know the 800 or so people that are being prosecuted there's about it but they about a thousand are jailed in Brazil right now although much more they're being much people are being much more bank accounts are being closed to the people who finance the buses and so on Good question 
Right. Yeah. Um, my question more broadly is where does Brazil go from here? So do you see a return of Bolsonaro or indeed Bolsonarismo and like how we have to deal with those implications for coming times? And then also, how do you begin to resolve this issue of polarization? You've talked about polarization sort of being maybe even a non-issue or what does that look like in the future? And how do we see that development, especially now that Lula has taken office? Is that decreasing or? Uh, yeah, what I would say is that um, <clears throat> on the issue of polarization, the aftermath of Lula's victory, and first of all, there's one thing about the two rounds. The first round, uh, Bolsonaro didn't come in first. Every election since 1989, the person who controls the central government because of the resources he can put into the, the networks of political machines that you need to be reelected, always comes in first in the second round, and he didn't. He did gain 3 million votes between the first and the second round, but the very fact that he came in low, you know, was a, you know, was a surprise and said something about, uh, something about it. But the aftermath of the second round of the election hasn't really seen polarization. It hasn't really seen the response you might imagine, even though lots of Bolsonaristas were, so-called Bolsonaristas were elected, although most of them are just opportunistic politicians who are looking to find a way to be part of the gravy train. Uh, the, 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 the extra parliamentary right wing movement that assaulted the federal, the, the Supreme Court, the executive building and the Chamber of Deputies and Senate, that movement, on the other hand, you know, they actually made it more difficult for the people that are elected Bolsonaristas to support them. And, but on the other hand, they're building an extra parliamentary movement thinking about where they'll be 10 years from now. If you're asking me, many Bolsonarista politicians and even some of the far right, Bolsonaro is symbolically really important, but a lot of them recognize that Bolsonaro was not a good politician. He's not a capable politician. He, well, he didn't know what to do. He didn't know how to handle things. He was very, you know, flighty and very, very, you know, just not a good politician. So, you know, Bolsonarismo with, I mean, Bolsonaro will always be revered. I seriously doubt that he will, you know, assuming he's not found, uh, you, you know, barred from running again, but I don't think he's, I don't think he's got a long career ahead in terms of being a, a successful candidate. On the other hand, the, the mass extra parliamentary movement that has gained some, you know, that has gained, because he has, he does have real support and most worryingly in the police forces, especially the military police force, which is, uh, you know, overwhelmingly the rank and file are, are black and brown people and things that he, he's also done the you know his big splash was spreading guns you know you know the uh, you know he led the opposition to gun control and then unleashed a vast armament movement uh, with millions of people now having guns that they couldn't have before he's got the militias there are certain cores of support which are really good for making chaos and things like that and then you've got, you know, but on the other hand, the electoral political aspect of it, of Bolsonarismo, I have a serious doubt. He was in like 15 parties over 27 years as an insignificant federal deputy and didn't really know how to run his government either. And or, you know, it, it just, he's a bad politician. He's not very good at what he does, but it was an extraordinary election and it tells us a lot about Brazil. That's it. Well, Thank you very much, John, Mariana, and Jessica for participating in this discussion. Thank the audience for great uh, questions. And thanks again, LaShawn, for providing the forum. Um, and I should uh, take a moment. Uh, I'm always off camera. So uh, to acknowledge Tom Shattuck um, from our uh, Perry World House team. Tom, if you could at least wave or let people know you're here who helped pull this program together. Um, we're really grateful that you all stayed. We added kind of 15 minutes to the program and you will be rewarded with more programming and more information. So um, I found um, that one of the great things about, uh, and this is not self applause or self congratulations for Perry World House, but part of the reason you come here is for complexity and for um, a disentangling of issues and a different type of analysis. And so I hope that we've provided that um, with the panel that we've had today. And as I say, almost every week that we hold these panels, you should leave here knowing more than when you came in. 
and you should know you should leave here having um, encountered a slightly different perspective than when you walked through the door. And I really hope that's been the case. So again, I want to thank um, the Center for Africana Studies, the Marginalized Populations Project, and the Center for Latin American and Latinx Studies for co-sponsoring today's program and making it as rich, in fact, as it is. Obviously, thank all of you online and in person for your participation. These programs are enhanced. They're better because of your questions and they make us rethink, in fact, some of our positions. I hope you'll come back, not just next week, but tomorrow at 4.30 when we will be hosting our next installment of our joint lecture series with the Andrea Mitchell Center for the Study of Democracy here at Penn. And that program will focus on commercialized military power since 1945. Um, also next week on the 21st of February, we will be holding another World Today that will be co-sponsored by the Center for East Asian Studies and is focused on Japan's new, new geopolitics after Abe. As always, you can access a YouTube recording of this program in a couple of days on YouTube. Um, you can also uh, join us online and sign up for our mailing list to follow all of our events, particularly through social media. And um, for those of you who are here, there's a grab and go snack in the student lounge and please let's give our panel another round of applause. <laughs>